Eastern Hills, we are so glad that you are here with us this morning. It's beginning to look a little bit like Christmas around here. Yeah, they told me to wear an ugly Christmas sweater. I don't own an ugly Christmas sweater, so I wore this sweet thing this morning, thank you. And uh, hey, quick question. How many of you have your tree up already? Okay, okay. And real tree or fake tree? Real, let me see real and fake. The forests are safe this year. Okay, perfect, there we go. Hey, we're gonna sing some songs together. We're gonna hear a talk. We're gonna end our time with another song. The reason why we do this every week is for us to even in the midst of a busy Christmas season, just pause and allow God to speak into our hearts this morning. So thanks for being here with us. If you're able, let's stand and sing together. Put your hands together. Here we go.
is to come in freedom, to lift high in the name of our Savior today, amen? So repeat after me.
that God might actually reveal himself to you today. Maybe life has just beat you up <laughs> a little bit too much and you're saying, God, if you're real, I need your word, I need your life, I need hope. I feel like someone needs to hear today that when God so lovingly sent his one and only son, Jesus, to this earth, he came to bring hope. To take on a sacrifice that we could never ever take ourselves. And he is living and enthroned above all, bringing hope to the world, the savior of all, our majesty, king of kings, lord of lords, our everlasting hope in this place. Amen, church. He is alive. Yes, he is alive. So we're gonna do something bold today. And we're gonna to decide to take the things that are weighing us down and lay them down at the foot of a living God. And say, God, no matter what, you alone are worthy of it all, of the glory, of the majesty, of the praise, you alone are worthy of it all. So church on one accord, we're gonna sing this as loud as we can, as loud as we can. Let's sing together. For you alone are And Father, we ask boldly that you would break down walls that we have wrongfully put up against you. Lord, that your word might speak loudly to our hearts. And God, that we would walk out of here forever changed because of what you've done for us. God, we are so forever grateful. And God, I ask boldly, would you speak loudly today? God, we thank you for what you're about to do. We give you praise for what you're going to do next. And all God's people said, Amen. Awesome. You can have a seat. You guys sound amazing this morning. 
What a great opportunity we have to come here this weekend and to worship together. If you're new here, maybe you're here for the very first time, maybe you're joining us online for the very first time, would you text the word new to the number that you see on your screen? We would love to get to know you a little bit better. If you're in the room after our service today, if you would head out into the lobby, you'll see a guest house out there. We'd love to meet you out there, uh, get to know you a little bit better. And we have a gift for you out there as well. Now, I wanna tell you about something uh, that we do kind of every, every month, every other month around here. It's called Backstage Pass. And whether you've been here for five minutes or five years or five, 50 years, I don't know how long, but this week we're doing it a little bit different. We're kind of like expanding Backstage Pass. It's a tour of the building. It's getting to know the different ministry areas. And today we're gonna do that, but everyone is invited. Everyone's invited to come check it out because what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be showing you some of the service opportunities that we have around here on the weekend. So if you're like, I've never even been upstairs in this building, we'll take you upstairs. If you're like, I wanna see where Kendall's messy office is, you can go see that on the tour. I mean, we're gonna show you all of that. And, and here's the cool thing. This, one, this time it's like Taste of Colorado Backstage Pass. We're gonna have snacks and drinks at every single one of the stations. So. I've been everywhere at church, but I'm going just for the snacks today. So I'd love to meet you there. The point is we are doing this after the 11 o'clock service this afternoon, so you have to come back, uh, but we would love for you to be here. Join us in Lacuna right after our 11 o'clock service about 12.05, and we would love to present Backstage Pass to you this weekend, show you some of the ministry opportunities we have around here on weekends. I also wanna tell you that all things Christmas, all things Christmas happen because of your generosity. And I just wanna say thank you to, if you give at Eastern Hills, if you've, that's something new to you, if you've been doing it for a while, thank you so much. And if you've never had that opportunity, you're interested in that, you can go to ehills.org slash weekend, find out all the information about how to give here. None of the stuff we do on weekends uh, throughout the week happens without you. And so we are so thankful. And we're also starting a new series this morning, taking a look at all of these broken and messed up people that kind of led up to Jesus. The fact that they needed the hope of Jesus is the same for us today that we need the hope of Jesus. So thanks for being here and welcome to week one of The Broken Beginning. The Christmas story gets told every year. It's full of wonder and magical memories of a night 2000 years ago that changed everything. But little baby Jesus lying in a manger wasn't born into a perfect lineage. His family tree was filled with imperfect people, starting with Abraham, the control freak, and the unlikely father of the Jewish nation. Years later, it continued through Rahab, a prostitute who protected a small group of Jewish spies, propelling God's people into the future that would bring Jesus. Jumping years ahead came David, a repentant failure who moved Israel and the world around them towards a moment that Jesus would be born into the world for all of us. Generations later, Mary had a dramatic change in her life plan. She wasn't ready to give birth to the savior of the world, but that's what the first Christmas brought Mary. This long line of unlikely, imperfect, and broken people used by God to tell the world of the greatest news anyone has ever heard. Well, hey, everybody, welcome. So glad that you are joining us today. Whether you're with us in the room or you're joining us online, we are beginning our Christmas series, getting ready for uh, a really, really special celebration of Christmas around here, and hopefully for you with your family and friends as well. Now, uh, this series really gets at kind of to the heart of something that I think a lot of us wrestle with around Christmas and church in general, of like, hey, my life feels really messy, and this whole thing we talk about seems very put together, very ornate, very pretty, um, and that's just kind of the way we make it look. When we actually dig in, especially to the lineage of Jesus, those uh, that God used to bring about the birth of the Messiah, the rescuer of the world, they're real people with real stories and uh, have problems and pain points, just like you and me. We're gonna look at one of those today, and uh, hopefully the encouragement to you is, if God can use them, he can use you too. But before we get started, I'm gonna pray for us. And if you've never been here before or never heard me speak, I pray kneeling. And the reason that I do that on a celebration where we're talking about hope today 
And what does it mean for us to find hope that's bigger than what we're going through? That that hope can't be found in whatever you get underneath the tree this year. It can't be found in whatever party or celebration you're looking for. Uh, the only hope that's durable in our life that can be found that transcends our circumstances and experiences is in Jesus. Let's ask him to give that to us today. Would you pray with me? God, thank you. Thank you that in the midst of disappointments, disappointments in people, disappointments in circumstances, disappointments in stuff, that we can find hope, contentment, and satisfaction in you. I pray that today as we look at Abraham's story and the journey that he had in learning to follow you and making mistakes along the way, that we could find some of the same hope that's still available for us today. It's in Jesus' name, amen. So I don't know about you, but I feel like when I think about people in my life that I just look at and are instantly good at something, all of a sudden in me, there's something that kind of wakes up, a, a level of frustration, I wish I could, I wish that I was like, right? But I wonder for you, uh, do you have a hobby, an activity, or maybe a job that you're good at today, but when you started it, you weren't very good at it. As a culture, I think we're kind of obsessed with overnight successes that took 20 years. We don't know, we can't realize, we see just the end result, the output, and we go, wow, that just looks like it was so easy, but it's because we're seeing the Instagram feed. We're seeing something where we see just the end result. Sometimes people ask me um, if, the, if I get comfortable doing this, like if it was something that just came naturally to me, to talking on a stage in front of people, and the short answer is no, <laughs> it was not easy, it did not come naturally. When I was young, as a matter of fact, if you don't know this, I had surgery on two lazy eyes. Uh, I had a debilitating stutter, and on top of that, uh, I had learning and reading disabilities with dyslexia. Getting better at this took a really long time. And while I believe that it was really helped by God being with me, and God wants to be with you and what you're pursuing as well, uh, it wasn't without any work. As a matter of fact, author and speaker Malcolm Gladwell, he talks about something called the 10,000 hour rule. Uh, that researchers have discovered that while we may uh, know that it takes work for people and 10,000 hours seems like a lot, that there always seems to be these people in our lives that are the exception to that rule. People who make it look easy. But he argues that it only looks that way. It takes work. And then he also says this. He says, the values of the world we inhabit and the people we surround ourselves with will have a profound effect on who we are. In other words, it's not just the hard work you put in, but it's the context of your community and the values that you live with that will most determine the outcome of your life long term. And giving up, giving up because you aren't, or if we're honest, sometimes we feel like our kids aren't, the prodigy, everything goes right for them, top of their class, is not just inaccurate, it's actually really unhealthy because it doesn't work that way for anybody. As we get ready to celebrate Christmas this year, it's certainly a good thing that God didn't give up on his plan to bring his son into the world when people messed up because he wouldn't have gotten very far. A follower of Jesus named Matthew starts his account of Jesus' life by sharing the genealogy of who God used in his lineage. And the names might surprise you. As a matter of fact, Matthew records it this way. He says, Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah, and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Abinadab, and Abinadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. Now, if you're not a church person, maybe you come to church kind of around Christmas time. This is kind of your church fix. Obviously, when we look at people like this in the Bible, we just assume these are kind of like pinnacle people, right? That they never made huge mistakes, that they just stayed on track, faithful to God's plan with their life. But that actually isn't what happens. That isn't what happens with anybody in the Bible, really. And it isn't what happens with this list. This list includes murderers, liars, cheaters, and a prostitute. And I'm guessing for you, when you think about those names being the names that God chose to be in the lineage that would ultimately bring about the savior of the world, well, that might feel more familiar. Maybe that feels more like the life and the circumstances of this world today. 
Maybe you can think about one or two of those terms with somebody that was sitting around the Thanksgiving table with you last week, right? It is easy for us once we start to realize with real actual eyes of reality, the kind of messed up, broken beginning that God used to bring about his son. Over the course of this series, we're gonna look at a few of these names that are on this list and the stories of God's faithfulness in the face of their failures and faults. And as we prepare to celebrate Christmas together, it can be such a a really important reminder for us that as Christians, our hope is in God's faithfulness, not our failures. Some of you, you dip your toe back into church and part of the thinking is, well, I've, I've needed to get myself kind of fixed up before I could come back. And some of you, you feel this weight and pressure about what it means for you to have it all together. But actually God's hope in your life is, it's not something that you have to fix your faults for. As a matter of fact, God wants to do the work in your life. You don't fix yourself and then come to God. You come to God that he might restore you and me, make us whole. We're gonna look at three seasons of this guy named Abraham's life. And the first comes in this amazing uh, picture for Abraham of a promised future, a future that Abraham got from God that no one else had ever gotten before, and I could argue no one has ever been given since. And this future is really, really important to the history of Israel and to the history for you and me of how God would bring about Jesus. Early on in high school, I played football with a guy named Chris, and Chris was really good at football. As a matter of fact, it was clear even in Pop Warner that he was gonna do well and go places. He got a scholarship to play D1 football early on in high school. And it was this amazing blessing and it was kind of a curse at the same time because while it was a tremendous benefit to have this to look forward to, to know that that was already taken care of, it also came with pressure. A pressure to stay healthy, a pressure to stay out of trouble, and a pressure to keep producing. And I think sometimes that's how it can feel about our future. Even the good parts, even the things we look forward to, You think about the family you have or the family you wanna have or the career that you wanna have or the future you wanna look to or the legacy you want to leave behind. All of a sudden, all those things can bring with them a pressure that can make you and me sometimes make compromises. Abraham is this guy that we're looking at and he's referred to as Father Abraham. And here's something uh, that is just, if you're not a church person, this is gonna get weird for a minute, okay? And you're like, that... Didn't make me feel better. But if you grew up in church and you went to Sunday school, you know a song. And the moment that I said Father Abraham, you thought like that song is going in your head right now. It's gonna be stuck there all day. Okay, let's just get it out of our system right now. Ready? Father Abraham, many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. Uh, And so are you, so... All right, there we go. So uh, great job. There you go. If you're an unchurched person, you're like, this is why I don't come to church. That was so weird. Uh, We don't normally do that stuff, but it's in us, right? That's just there. We call him Father Abraham today because he was used by God to be the father of the Jewish nation of Israel. As a matter of fact, there were plenty of bumps along the way in God's story of Abraham. And early on in his calling, God reveals this amazing promise to him. In Genesis chapter 12, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, which was his name before it was changed to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now this promise, this covenant that God just makes with him, it happens for Abraham in a world that is not like our world. It's a tribal world without laws, without common values, and danger was everywhere. The safest and smartest plan to survive in this moment in human history was to stay near your family, was to insulate yourselves from the dangers of other cultures, and to just stay put. But God called Abram at that time, later he would be called Abraham, to leave his homeland. As a matter of fact, not only was he challenged to leave, he was challenged to leave without knowing where he was going. All the while, he is 75 years old. Talk about a retirement plan, like make the most dangerous thing you're ever going to do right now. And with this, God gives him some really special promises, that there would be a great nation from him, that he would be a blessing whose name would be great. 
and what's referred to as the Abrahamic covenant in which God promises to bless those uh, who bless and curse those who curse this nation, this nation, God's people, Israel, that actually still exists today. Now, the pressure of this kind of future weight on Abraham, it weighed on him. And even though we can see God's faithfulness in Abraham's life and in Israel's life with the benefit of hindsight, we get to see it forward looking back. He didn't have that. And sometimes I think this happens in our lives too. We, we feel like there's this picture of a future we could have. We feel like there's this picture of something years from now that we can believe for, that we can experience. But then in the, in the interim period, it becomes very easy to doubt. And as we get ready for Christmas, I would encourage you to think about the promises that God has made about your future too. We think about what's underneath the tree, what's waiting in January, or even maybe someday retiring. But God's promises for our future are different. And they can be really hopeful if we know what they are. If, if you and I will actually let what God says for you and me, that if you're a follower of Jesus, I'm gonna show you some promises that are promises you can take to the bank. They're promises that are true for you beyond your circumstances, behind how this Christmas goes, behind how the last 18 months have gone. Eternal promises from God. And if you're not a Christian, choosing to follow Jesus gives you these promises as well. And so if you're here and you have a phone, you wanna take a picture of this list and just be reminded of it, feel free. Here are some of God's promises for you this Christmas. Things that the... Christmas experience can't take away. That if you still have a pulse, God still has a plan for you. That there is this promise that for those who know Jesus, he is working every day to draw you closer to him and he is faithful to do that every day of your life. That your hope in Jesus brings an eternal inheritance that cannot be taken away. Your picture of what it means to know God and trust him is eternal. There's nothing that could happen in geopolitics. There's nothing that could happen with the stock market. There's nothing that could happen with your family that could take away the inheritance from God now and forever. That the grief you're experiencing right now, the pain that you're in the middle of, is nothing compared to the glory of heaven. There's a passage where the Apostle Paul, a leader and church planner in the first century, talks about all the times that he's close to death and each time he's saying, you know what? I don't even consider the stuff that I've gone through worthy to compare when I think about what's waiting for me in heaven. God is better at preparing for your future than you are. I know that for some of us, what we end up doing is where we cut corners, where we make compromises is those areas where we think, I need to figure this out. I need to be the one that takes care of this. But actually, those compromises, God usually spends some time working those compromises backwards, helping you and me find the better path that he wanted us to go on all along. And then lastly, uh, Jesus is coming back and we are going to heaven. And there is this really challenging thing that as we look around our world, we think like how many different things could go wrong? And if this world is where our hope lies, a lot of things can go wrong. But the good news of Jesus is that all of these promises for you and me, they point into eternity. They're forever kind of promises. And whatever you get or don't get this Christmas, whatever you experience or don't experience in the next season, in Jesus, all of those are yours. See, these are the promises that can really help us during difficult times, even when things aren't going well. And they remind us that the same God who used Abraham can use us. Because just like Abraham, our hope is in God's faithfulness, not our failures, not the stuff that you've done, not the stuff that's been done to you, that there is something so much bigger that God can give you and me in hope as we anticipate and prepare for Christmas together. But when we forget who God is and who we are in him, like Abraham does throughout his life a bunch of times, uh, we settle for the second part of his story, which is a compromised trust. A compromised trust. You know the future. You've been told what's gonna happen. You feel like there's a promise you can rely on. But instead of choosing to do that, you start to take steps in a different direction. I wonder, how do you handle it when someone betrays your trust? I don't know about your experience, but for me, um, when I violate someone's trust or they violate mine, it usually results in relational distance and separation. It takes time and genuine remorse for things to be different. Even if initial forgiveness is offered, there are healthy steps needed for reconciliation. See, the thing is, usually in our lives, we come to a place where we kinda like make a mistake or we make a compromise, and the Bible describes you and me like a clay vessel. And so I think that sometimes those mistakes for us, we just 
sort of kind of measure the cost benefit analysis. And we think like, it's not that big of a deal. We just think like, yeah, there's that little compromise that there's that little area where I've gone my own way, but like, it's not that bad. I, I think I'll be fine. I can manage the consequences. I can handle the outcome. I don't have to let people in. And in our relationship with God and in our lives, I think sometimes what we don't realize is happening is that those consequences are building up. Let me just give you a few and see if any of these little compromises of trust, these little areas of going your own way and taking a shortcut in your connection with God maybe line up to you, right? Maybe it's something like, you know what? We'll just put this, credit, this Christmas on the credit card and we'll deal with it in January. Does that sound familiar? Or you'll think, you know what, um, I'm just good friends with that guy or girl. My spouse doesn't need to know. Or maybe you think, you know what, it's just one more drink. It's a holiday party. Or maybe you think, my company, they don't have to know. They won't even miss it. Or maybe for you, you think, it's the end of the semester. It's the end of the quarter. It's just one more assignment. And after a while, it starts to build up. My spouse doesn't have to know. You think, it's my money, I'll do what I want with it. You think, I'm just tired, it's been too long, I deserve it. Sound familiar? See, the amazing thing is that when we do that in relationships with one another, it's only a matter of time before the distance that it creates between one another feels, feels absolutely irreconcilable. But when we think about this with God, the amazing thing about God, and we see this all the time in Abraham's life, is that he doesn't let failure create distance in our relationship with him. It actually seems like he uses failure for greater closeness and tighter relationship with him. And that's really good news, especially for the folks in Jesus' lineage. As a matter of fact, after countless times of not trusting God in his relationship and journey on this wild ride that God has asked him to stay faithful, there's this one thing that God has asked Abraham to trust him with that he just can't make sense of. And so Abraham makes a terrible decision. In Genesis 16, it says, now Sarai, which is Sarah, Abraham's wife, before her name was changed, Abraham's wife, uh, had borne him no children She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Now, after what was most likely years and years of trying to have kids in their younger years unsuccessfully, there is this huge challenge that they're facing, right? God has said, you are going to be the father of an entire nation. And at this point, they are in a really, really difficult spot because in our culture, it can feel really, really pressure sensitive that if you are married and like people are asking, hey, when are you gonna have kids? When are you gonna have kids? When are you gonna have kids? And if you have struggled with infertility, maybe you're in the middle of it right now, you know the pain probably that Abraham and Sarai were facing. Some of you, you know what this feels like, the weight of waiting, the pain of perseverance and not knowing if a child would ever come. And so for Abraham and Sarah, for all the promises that God had made to them, it feels like they gotta help God out. And sometimes I think that's what we feel like. We feel like we, we compromise just a little bit to kind of help God out in our life. And so they take it into their own hands. Now, before you judge them too harshly, at this point, Abraham is about 86, Sarah about 76, And even with people living longer back then, it was still physically impossible for them to have kids at this point. And that's the problem. They were regularly trying to force God's miraculous plan through their own actions. And we do the same thing. We think, God, I I know you want me to be with this person. God, I know you want me to have this thing. God, I I know you want me to be successful in this job. And so all of a sudden, we just start cutting some corners. We just start taking some shortcuts that we know don't honor God. And if you've been around for a while, you, you probably know this about me, but I don't like putting together uh, Ikea furniture. That's the first time I've picked up a hammer in months. Um, okay, the laughter was a bit much, okay? That's... 
But I don't like putting together like Ikea furniture. And uh, part of the reason is I'm, like, I'm just not very good at it. And usually when I get to the, near the end of a project, I'll find myself looking at the directions and they'll say, hey, you need to find this part to finish this project. And I'm like, well, I don't think they included the part. Uh, and so I just find like another part that's pretty close, you know, and I just think this is fine. And I like jam the part that's close into the section that the other part is supposed to go into. Would not recommend uh, one star. And it does not go well usually, right? But I think that sometimes we do this in our lives with God too. We know what obedience looks like. It looks like self-control, patience, putting others first. We know what it means, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, self-control, that God has actually given you and me if we're followers of Jesus to flow out of our lives. But we go a different direction, don't we? We think it's close enough. I want the shortcut, I want it right now. And that's what they do here. So Sarah suggests to Abraham that he take their servant, Hagar, And we don't know how old Hagar is at this point, but we know that she was way younger than Abraham. And while all of this might have seemed kind of normal in the culture that they were in, it wasn't what God wanted for them. This wasn't how God wanted them to have a child. And immediately, once Hagar had this child, Sarah knew how wrong it was. And we can argue about whether or not she handled it the right way. She did not. Um, But there is still, in this moment, like there's this awareness of, oh my goodness, how could I possibly have done this. Imagine if Alyssa and I couldn't have had kids early on and it had gone on and on in our life. And then at some point after exploring all kinds of different options, she suggested that I go on The Bachelor and then I go into the fantasy suite with as many women as possible, right? Like that's modern day example. You're like, that's a really bad idea. And like Abraham and Sarah just didn't have friends that were like, that's a terrible idea. The entire thing's fake anyway, right? Like that's not a good plan and it works out just as messy for them when Sarah would eventually go on to have a child and God would miraculously provide for them which had been his plan all along for them this compromise would start opposing nations even though it was never how God designed it to work the Palestinian Israelites today would point to either Isaac or Ishmael as their source of their divine birthright for the land that they're trying to currently inhabit It's easy, it's so easy to be hard on Abraham and Sarah, but how different are we? You know what we do with our broken lives? Like we all know this is true of us. Maybe it's a few less hammer hits. Maybe it looks a little bit different in your life, but we all have some version of this. And you know what we do? We just do this. We hide what's really going on. We show people the part that we want them to see and then we take a selfie. And we live this edited selfie life. But the thing is, um, that version of you and me isn't real. And when we shift how we present ourselves to other people so that they can't see our brokenness, so that they can't see our shame, so that no one gets let in, we build our lives and our relationships around lies. And the people in your life, they like things about you that sometimes aren't even true. Things that you know, you know what, this actually isn't really me, but I've been building years and years where this gap has been created of the brokenness that I know is true of me that nobody knows about and how I present myself. And what years ago maybe felt like this big a distance has become this big. And so now the stakes feel so big. How could you come clean? How could you be honest with your spouse, with your closest friends, with family members? How could you be honest? Isn't that a weight that feels a little too heavy to carry? I wonder what is taking God's plan into your own hands caused in your life? Have there been wins, like long-term wins? When you try to cut corners, when you make compromises, when you decide it's up to you rather than him? That's not what God's faithfulness does. Being faithful is a long-term strategy of walking with God. It has the benefits of compound interest. That if you and I will do this, not for just a few months, not for just a few years, but for decades and decades of our life, preparing for eternity with God, that's the kind of life that we're called to live. And Christmas serves as such a good reminder of this. We start to see presents kind of line up, right? They, they start to stack up maybe underneath the tree or you see Amazon boxes. You're like, is that room in our house, a warehouse at this point? Like it just is growing and growing. 
And in our current moment, in our context, with instant gratification and self-indulgence as our primary values today, we want them right now. It's always funny to me to hear people that get stuff on Black Friday for Christmas, but like somebody can't wait for it, so then they open it, so they have to buy like more gifts for Christmas, like that's a warning sign, you know? And um, just like we have to wait for that stuff, we are waiting for God's promises to be fulfilled in our lives, and they're worth the wait. When we celebrate Jesus' birth each Christmas, we are reminded of the patience of God's people generation after generation after generation as they waited for Jesus to come 2,000 years ago. And we get to walk in that same faithfulness because our hope in God, it's in his faithfulness, not our failures, not the areas of brokenness. We can be honest about that it. It never depended on you and me and me being perfect anyway. Abraham's story is long and even now thousands of years later after God did everything that he said he was gonna do, we're still experiencing the fulfillment of God's promises to him, including demonstrating kind of our final thought tonight or today, which is God's exponential faithfulness. God's exponential faithfulness. That God continues to show up in ways that no one could have ever dreamed at the moment that he made these promises to Abraham. Over and over again in the Hebrew scriptures, we see this amazing picture of God doing things that nobody thought was possible. The New Testament in your Bible often shows how God is consistent and faithful from the earliest characters in the Hebrew scriptures and how he will be faithful with you and me into all of eternity. There's actually one chapter in particular that focuses on this connection where the author says this, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of that place to, uh, to, uh, that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going, by faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has its foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of the heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. This list that we just read, just a part of, is often referred to as the hall of faith. And it's interesting to see how God uses and sees flawed and faulty people because they are all flawed and faulty people. We sometimes, I think today, we see our lives and we see our failures as the true nature of who we are. We assign our identity to our worst moments, to the worst things that we've done and to the worst things that have been done to us. But that's not how God sees us. As a matter of fact, in relationship with God through Jesus, he sees your and my failures. He sees the things that we have done and have been done to us. And yet our identity is his son, his daughter, that actually we are adopted into his family because of Jesus. This, isn't, um, this is amazing because this isn't just with this list that we're reading here, it's with us. That when we read these verses, we get to see this beautiful spiritual resume for Abraham and Sarah that doesn't make their failure the headlines. And it very easily could have. If you go through Abraham's life, you're gonna see failure after failure after failure, but it makes God's faithfulness in their life and their response to it the main point, the arc of their life. I wonder, is there something in your life where you're letting the headlines of your past be your failures, be your identity? Your brokenness, all of it, right? When we give it to God, God actually wants to use our past pain. He wants to use our present problems. He wants to use the brokenness of our life for something incredible that he can do in and through you actually because of it, not in spite of it. All the names on this list, and in the genealogy of Jesus, stand out because they're a part of a bigger plan. There have been tons of good people that God has used, but these people were a part of a bigger story that was so much bigger than their moment. And when we let God show up in our lives with a bigger story that isn't just about us, that isn't just about how we get to connect in this moment, when we connect to this Christmas message in a bigger, special way, we get to be in that same line. See, these people were all used by God to bring about the Messiah, the rescuer of the whole world. Even in the middle of their mistakes, God could call them back to himself, a bigger plan and the work that he had for them. And he can do the same thing with you too. Because of how God used them, we know that God loves us. 
that our brokenness would separate us from God if it weren't for the offer that he made in his son through that very first Christmas. That because of his sinless life, unjust death, and miraculous resurrection, we can trust him with our life like these people did. And a part of an even bigger story, a bigger story that we get to actually read about the finished work of Jesus, that we get to trust in the finished story that he completed for us 2,000 years ago. So if you're here or you're watching and you're not a Christian, this community is filled with people whose stories show how this bigger story of God is still playing out and still available to you. That the abundant life of Jesus and the eternal life of heaven are waiting for you this Christmas. And God has been patiently waiting for you to return to him. You know, one of the things that I think is so difficult for us sometimes in Christmas in the real life of it is we have this picture in our mind of a manger scene. And when Christmas comes, that picture can feel like the pressure and the weight of making sure everything is perfect, picture perfect. Everything hits exactly where it's supposed to and can function just like how we think it did then. But the wonder of Christmas is not that the picture looked so ornate and pretty and everything was great, that outside that inn where there was no room, there were smelly animals, there was loud noises, it was getting cold. The savior of the world came into the nitty gritty realities of it. And the people that God used as the lineage to bring about the savior of the world remind us that God assumes and knows about our brokenness, that we don't have to hide it anymore. That if he could use the brokenness of all of these people, he can use your and my brokenness as well. See, I know that for us, it's amazing to look back and think about something like this that felt so difficult for them to believe and impossible for broken people to achieve. But here we are 2,000 years later and these people who trusted God with it, imperfect and all actually pulled it off. Imagine what God can do in your life if you would trust him. In our study today, we see how Abraham and Sarah were this unlikely couple to have a child because of how old they were. And in the Christmas story, we see Mary and Joseph as unlikely parents because of how young they were. This connection where both require one another, where this bigger story of God needed one another, it needs you too. Isn't it, isn't it crazy, right? About how likely the world sees what God can do in your life, when you show up, when you're strong, but it isn't, it isn't about somebody else looking at you and saying, I think you can do this, I think you're qualified, I think you can figure it out. It isn't about the world around you recognizing it. It's about the God of the universe believing in the potential for your life because he put it in you, that when you're connected to him, there's something bigger for you. This Christmas, you have some hopes and some dreams about the kind of connections that you want. What if you trusted God to show up this Christmas rather than assuming that he wouldn't? Rather than assuming that it was just about how much you could accumulate, the kind of experiences you could have, the kind of memories you could make over the next few weeks that you'd be paying off in lots of different ways for years to come. What if this Christmas was about finding moments of wonder that are real moments of wonder with him? Last week, I challenged you to ask your family, not just what do you want this Christmas, but what does your family need this Christmas? The reason for Jesus coming to earth wasn't to put presents we wanted under trees. It was to deliver us from our sin and brokenness, to solve a need we didn't even know we had. Each year as a family, right after Christmas, we take a road trip up to Wisconsin to see Alyssa's family. And it is a lot, it's a lot, it's a lot of work. It takes a ton of packing to go there for a week. Like sometimes I wonder if we are preparing to move to Wisconsin based on how much we are packing to go there. It takes getting crabby kids up really early in the morning and a really long drive. And if I let the way the trip started shape how I thought about it and my memory of it, we'd never do it again. <laughs> but it's how it finishes. It's the time that we get to have with family. It's the experiences that we get to remember together. It's, it's all of it. And I would just encourage you, don't let the way your story or even this season started shape how you remember it. God is still writing your story and he is in the business of taking broken people and making your whole life find hope in him. What if the expectations you had for this Christmas centered on the hope that Jesus still provides? 
What if instead of doing bigger and better everything than previous years, you were honest about where you were, about what your family needed, and you let Jesus show up to provide that this year? He can do it. Can I pray for you that he will? God, everyone in this room, everybody that's watching online, they're, they're carrying expectations. Some of those expectations are excitement about what's coming up and the things that they're dreaming for and hoping for in the coming days. Some of them, God, they're dreading. They're dreading the past hurts. They're dreading the regrets. They're dreading so much. And God, we ask that right now you would show them a hope that's bigger, that's heavier than all of that hurt. That this Christmas, regardless of what happens in their circumstances, that they would trust you for your eternal promises. The people that don't know you this Christmas, God, they might come to know you. That in a world that has reminded us over and over again that it can never provide durable hope, God, help us to turn to you. You've been offering it all along the way. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Now, in just a second, we're gonna sing a song together. And this song will remind us of something that I think is so important. The Bible says that there is no under, other name under heaven by which we can be saved but the name of Jesus. This is not some sort of like religious buffet where we take a little bit here and a little bit here, but the work of Jesus is the work to save mankind. And when we sing and when we talk to, and when we think about the person and work of Jesus, it literally ripped history in half. Your every day on your calendar reminds you of his imprint on history. So if you're here and you're hearing this song for the first time, join whenever you feel ready. But if you're in the room, would you stand with us and sing?
about it, church. Think of that scene. The undefeated one. He is coming down. He is for us. Think of the majesty and sovereignty of God as he takes us. Sing with us. The earth will sing and tremble. There is no other name than Jesus where our hope comes from. Here's the challenge for this week. The first week of December, as you're gonna go into this busy month, we're gonna put a lot of hope into gifts, family, family gatherings, experiences, all of those things. But what if we started the month by just saying, we understand and we know that our hope can only come from Jesus. All those other things, they might work out, they might be great, but they might not. But Jesus will always be there for us. Thank you so much for being here with us this week. I also wanna tell you about Christmas. Our Christmas services are coming up on December 23rd and 24th. We'd love for you to register for those services so we know how many people are coming, your kids, make sure everybody's taken care of. We also would love to have you come and serve with us Christmas Eve and the day before, kind of all hands on deck. They are gonna be amazing services. All the information about Christmas you need is at ehills.org slash weekend. There's a Christmas button there. It'll give you all the information that you need, but we can't wait to see you guys throughout this month. Have a great week and we'll see you guys next time.